So Ryan, uh, thanks so much for uh, taking our little tour of Amsterdam and uh, talking a little bit about uh, what you're working on and what you're doing. Um, and uh, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. So I'm, I'm Ryan Hallisey, I'm an engineer at NVIDIA. I, uh, I work on building the infrastructure for GeForce Now. And, okay. Uh, GeForce Now is a cloud gaming service, so kind of like what I said to people is uh, if you ever wanted to get access to a nice 3080 and stream Cyberpunk on it from your phone, uh -huh. you can use GeForce Now. Nice, yeah. nice. And is it, it's available, like you can go out and like pay for it now? Yes, you can. Sweet. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I may have to check it out more. Like I remember reading about it, but I had never actually kind of gone and looked at it. Um, and because, uh, you know, like I have kids and a job, and so playing a lot of video games is not high on my list of things I can do anymore, uh, which is depressing. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, I know you just gave a talk. What was your talk about? So my, my talk was about uh, my experience as an end user of Kubert. So uh, GeForce Now, the infrastructure behind it, it heavily leverages Kubernetes and, and Kubert. And so we went over kind of some of the use cases that we have and how we use Kubert, how we use Kubernetes. And, Gotcha. Like it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, so do you code every day, or are you uh, are you management now? Or are you? No, uh, I I kind of do. Let's see, I do a lot of I do a lot of coding when I can, and uh, do some architecting. And, yeah, 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 yeah. I was uh, talking to somebody else earlier. It's like the the only downside about being in the software world is a lot of us got into it because we like to code, yeah. and as you get more senior, you <laughs> oh. get to code less and less. Exactly. Um, you know, but uh, you know, it's nice to be able to keep your hands dirty sometimes. Yeah, I'm, I'm involved heavily in the community. Like, I'm one of the maintainers of Qvert, and so I, I'm active in the community and uh -huh. contributing features, design proposals, stuff like that. Um, and I'm very active in, uh, in a few of the SIGs in the community as well. So I, I feel like I know this answer a little bit, um, but uh, so what brought you to kind of open source and or Kubernetes in the first place? Well, so there, there's a lot of things. I mean, I, I, like Kubernetes... Um, so me personally? Or, yeah, yeah, you personally. Me yeah. personally. Yeah. So for me, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's a really, it, the project is, is really exciting. I mean, it's like, it's really cool because I, I, I like understand it. I sort of connect to it at a, at a very low level as someone who like understands infrastructure and likes to build things mm -hmm. and understand like what it takes to launch a workload on my local laptop. Yeah. And then, and think about like all of like the bash scripts that I ever had to deal with in order <laughs> to launch that workload. And then I think about like why the Kubernetes does it. It's sort of like encapsulating a lot of the knowledge that, that people would go through, like mm -hmm. all those experiences that you go through in order to actually launch a workload. Yeah. Became like kind of a lot of the way I look at Kubernetes. I mean, you can think about like a deployment and stuff, right? Like I could, I could do a create a deployment like resource if I wanted to, if I had like a bash job that's constantly running and it's constantly replacing things if I notice, you know, watching events something on, going something down on the bus. Yeah. And right, like, you could almost do this. And, and it's like, and so I kind of think of it like that. And so to me, as someone who's really curious and interested in building new and exciting things, it makes a lot of sense And someone who's had a lot of experience in this area. So that was something that was really exciting to me. And I, and I think that's why a lot of people are excited about it. They really connect to that part of Kubernetes. And, and that's really why the community is, is, is so exciting and there's a lot of right. people here. And so it really kind of feeds the energy and, why it's such an exciting project, and that's why I like being involved in the community. Yeah, yeah, um, and uh, kind of related. So, what brought you to open source in general to begin with? Sure. Uh, for for me, I I, I always found it fascinating. Uh, I had even before um, you know I, I contributed to my first open source project. I always thought it was kind of interesting to share my projects with people mm -hmm. and so I was w well before I understood open source and really what it meant but it was something that to me that I, I, I found it interesting when when I had my friends and I had work that I wanted to show with them so they could use it yep. and what I didn't really realize is I was actually doing open source I was building my own community of, of software and so naturally like when you know hearing open source and, and what like there's a whole world of open source eventually when I you know graduate school and, and I was like well this seems like something that I, I already do and it seems like something I already like so I, I I'm really interested in this like I kind of wanted to give us a try that's cool. That's cool. Um, and so, so you were, and that was because I know you were a Red Hat, and so that's what kind of brought you to Red Hat. Yeah, I I, I had heard of Red Hat, and um, I had been familiar with Linux and familiar with Red Hat software, and uh, so for me, uh, Red Hat was was like like a dream. Like it was like, wow, this is the Linux place. And, right. Uh, right. I, I definitely wanted to give this a try and work. And this is the play the center of open source. So it was very appealing to me. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that's really cool. The, um, I think it's funny, right? There's, um, you know, at Red Hat, right? There's there's people who definitely are coming in kind of with a leg up, right? Where you actually know what Linux is, right? And have been using it or really interested in it. But then there's other engineers, right? Who like have very little to no experience with Linux. And, and they're like, you know, they know they've heard of Red Hat, you know, but uh, it's just kind of interesting. But then, you know, the, the I would say a, a large majority though are coming in with, you know, like because they're passionate about you know open source and Linux and you know stuff like that and it's really you know quite cool to be able to do that sort of thing um, yeah I see that a lot I mean like at Red Hat in my experience at Red Hat I saw that a lot that was the thing you see is, is the passion for open source it's very very prevalent in the culture and, and how um, and, and at the company I made a, a bit of a wrong turn, so we're doing a, a different tour of yeah. Amsterdam than I've done before um, in error because I, I got forced into a left uh, right turn that I didn't mean to get forced into. <laughs> so, um, so that's why you're getting a little bit scenic, of a different tour. Scenic route. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so hopefully we'll make it back to the correct route eventually. Um, but that is why we have the uh, you know nav going because <laughs> I don't know Amsterdam. Um, but ooh, speed bump. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, sorry, back to our regular scheduled programming. Um, so where does kind of Qvert come into play? Like so you said, it's kind of involved in um, uh, GeForce Now, um, but what, like, how does it kind of do that? Sure. Or what does it do there? Yeah, sure, so um, the, the, that, what I tell people is like, NVIDIA and, and NVIDIA and specifically GeForce Now like virtual machines, and it's mm -hmm. a, um, it's, you know, virtual machines are a very popular solution and, and we use them, we use them a lot. And uh, so this, this idea of like, Kubernetes is, is out there as an ecosystem and a way of doing things, a microservice architecture using containers. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, and there's it's all this big community around it. And so, you know, we like VM, so well, okay, let's try, you know, can we, can we go to this kind of model? Like, can we actually look at using, you know, a, a microservice approach in containers? So this was kind of our, our, the thought process. And, and so when looking at um, what our existing solution was, we, we still want to maintain the existing investment in using virtual machines. And so with Qvert, Qvert provided the ability for us to actually go to Kubernetes and get the leverage the ecosystem as well as continue to be able to run virtual machines. So right. it's a natural fit for us to be able to continue to with that investment and, and get the best of, because we like Kubernetes, we kind of want to use the some of the things around that, that Kubernetes has. And so we do that for some, some things and services that we have. We also like VM, so we use Qvert to continue to run uh, Gotcha. gotcha. Does uh, like and so you know I'm sure you know the the infrastructure isn't just like those VMs, right? Um, so is there like it, it, do you get to take advantage of, of kind of the rest of Kubernetes? So in other words, like do you have containerized you know components of the system that all, like integrate with those pieces? Yeah, we do. So so we use um, with Kubernetes like we integrated you know all the layers, CNI layers, mm -hmm. and CDI layers, all everything. We we in the CRI layer, everything. So. We, we, we're integrated all those layers. And then also um, we do have our own components. Like a lot of the stuff that came along, you know, after we like, we, hey, we want to use this, you know, we, we needed to come up with components to run as pods to work with our existing stack. And so a lot of all, pretty much all of that work was done as containers. And okay. Little, very little of it. Once, once we started using Kubernetes became like, you know, we don't want to continue to use VMs for our management or control plane we want to try and get as much onto containers as possible and leverage kubernetes right so in the case so for the, a lot of the new stuff the uh, new stuff i should say is the is the uh is, is using containers and and so some of the stuff even we, we've you know anything that we have used in the prior generation architecture we we even try to to move to a containerized uh workload mm -hmm. in some cases it works well some cases it doesn't it's just it just is what it is but um so it but it works for us like if we continue to keep uh, if you have a swing around, it's fine. But yeah. in cases that you know we find it fits, then then we use it. Right. We use right. containers. And so you've, and that's that's what I'm. Uh, what I think is kind of most interesting of like kind of talking to a user of the of the tool chain is like and and the, you've gotten that to work right so like you can have um, you know those operating together and it, it seems to you know consistently do what you want it to do in a sense yeah yeah exactly yeah we've, we've been able to get what we want out of it and I, and I, the thing that we like I always say we lo really love about Kubernetes is like um, 
that, uh, like I was talking about earlier, like being able to revive workloads, sort of have that uh, ability to, for workloads to return when they fail. Something that like the resiliency, right, that yeah. the platform offers. We really like that. And then and in the community as well, like the, the, the feature velocity and then, and also the ability to contribute like to the, the existing velocity is also really exciting too. Yeah. And we like contributing back. Right, and so do you? Do you feel like you know? Are uh, are you regularly contributing? You know, features that you think are important and that you need back into the upstream. Yeah, yeah. So we have we have um, influence in different parts of the community. Um, some in a little bit in Kubernetes, and then some in, in, in more in Kubert. And so like we've we've had some uh, very specific ones. Like with Kubert, we've done VSOC. We collaborated with Google to create VSOC and contribute back. We've cool. created some new APIs in Kubert. We actually. Um, when I, we call it uh, virtual machine pools. Mm -hmm. It's like um, an AWS. It's um, like auto scaling groups, and right? Something like right. that. And uh, we so we created that because it's it it perfect for how we do, it represents how we use our, our workflow. We we have lots of VMs and they kind of they come in and out constantly. We have churn, right. and so we kind of you use the to, uh, like you use like the golden image VM kind of model where yeah. you have like one VM that's like stock and then you spin them out when you need them. Yeah, kind of, so kind of like we we do like we basically have uh, like we images that we distribute throughout our zones like whenever we have updates or changes yeah in SOS, yeah yeah and so we we do do that and um yeah and so yeah we've been we've contributed to the community a bunch of different ways those are just some some examples and and we've got some other things like even in the kubernetes community there's some colleagues that are, that have been that are working in different areas for uh, and resource allocation and some other changes for uh other ways that you can make um gpus available in kubernetes yeah 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 and so um you know i i kind of have been asking this from kind of a different bunch of different perspectives but like so why do you think like do you think that kubernetes um you know if it wasn't kind of an open source project like what you know what's the what's the trade-off like what might be better or worse about it um that you think you know is a benefit to being open source if there is one sure so i a, i haven't really thought about it but you know i being being open source i i mean i think i, I think what it what it does is it, I mean, it gets, like I was saying, the, the, the velocity, I think the, the feature velocity, the developer mm -hmm. velocity, there's just a lot of access to, to different ideas and use cases. And what we found is like when, when we look at the project, we see, we see like, like 90% of a solution. Like we get like, mm -hmm. we get a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. And that's great. Like that's actually probably around what we want. And, right. and, and then like, we want to do the rest. So yeah. like if, if it was maybe closed source, I mean I I, I don't know. I mean it's it could vary like in, in how we um, how we could want to, to approach it. But I mean right. we kind of like like I guess the way you look at it is like we kind of like doing the the management of the infrastructure. Like we like that yeah. and, and we, we want to be responsible for we, we don't wanna like go and um, like uh, you know, we sell GPUs and then go rent them from someone else. We want to actually, <laughs> we actually want to put data, GPUs in our data centers and run them in, in the world class way. And, and that's and that's what we do. And that's so it requires us, you know, learning new things and trying to, to make it work. So an open source solution is a perfect fit. For right. Us. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was talking to somebody earlier that made a really interesting point was that you know, um, you know, when you when you look at uh, software, right? Any software makes a whole bunch of choices that are like trade offs between various things, and you know, it's just kind of required right and and the the you have certain biases around where those trade-offs should be depending on the use case and all this different stuff but he was saying what was really interesting for him about open source was that um he can look at the application that he's going to build on top of essentially and understand where their trade-offs and bias choices were so that he can make in his code either similar or complementary choices so that he can get you know really good pairing with the open source software that you'd never be able to do with proprietary software. Um, I don't know, does that resonate with you? I thought it was super interesting. Yeah, it does because, so, well, so here's a pretty pretty simple idea. Like, if I wanted to find the developer who contributed, I could find the developer. Right, right, if you had to, yeah. Him, right? right, I could get blame, right? Right, right. That's what it's there for, right? So, yeah, so I, I mean, I could find this person and I, and I could look it up. And then, and also you know, with, with communities, you see like all the, um, the conversations are had on mailing lists and on, on you know other sort of uh, you know, IRC or Slack, whatever. Like it's out in the open, and so you can read all the context as much as you want and to see what the biases were, right? The, what yeah. were the what was the context that went into this decision? Right. And and you, and, and and you know, and you can have a conversation with the person, and 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 that, usually that person, I mean, 
in a project that's open source is probably still around if they're right. still maintaining right. that feature. It's likely the case. Right. And you can talk to them about it and, and, and bring your own perspective and see right. if it makes sense. And complain. Sense. Yeah. And complain. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, exactly. You could complain. And, and, and so, yeah, I mean, and then what can result from that? Well, it could be some new code, a new mm -hmm. use case, a new direction. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, you know, maybe it's like, maybe you were wrong. Like right. Maybe it's you, a, you understand. Maybe you're. Oh, I didn't think of that part. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Maybe because the reason this person did it this way is because they were thinking like you were before and now you just needed the conversation to get more context so right, right. it's very it's, it's a well of knowledge like there's yeah. not just not just like the code itself but the access to that information is so helpful for making decisions so one of the other things i think is interesting and you know especially coming from you know you spent some time at red hat um from uh you know how much has uh, open source contributed to your ability to write Oh, so that's a good question. So, um, and I mean English or you know sure, uh, spoken yeah. word, not not code. Yeah, I I um, so that, that's that's funny. So I I've thought about this before, like uh, because uh, as someone, uh, I never really liked writing. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. something that was my favorite thing, but I I quickly learned that like you have to be really really good with with your communication over different channels and not really I mean I wouldn't even say spoken word because like most of it's not right like it's over text based channels that you have to be really good at getting your point across and communicating exactly what you mean mm -hmm. or you're gonna have a hard time like it's really it's really easy just because people you know time is finite and as well as you know people's attention so like you know how do you get someone's time to be able to communicate what you need and also like how you get it so like you know make people angry or you know, <laughs> right, make it right. seem like you're not listening to what they're yeah, saying yeah. there's there's some really there's some nuances that are really important that that go into and i think it's like a skill like learning uh, you can almost say like learning to communicate in the open source world is, is, is like is a skill there's a way to do it and and it's not just like writing which had my writing has improved yeah and yeah. had to like in order to do it but there's certain there's a style to it and 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 that's something that i i, I definitely think my writing has has improved over time yeah yeah uh i know like from working at red hat i know my writing got a lot better um you know and it just i find it really interesting that you know that's certainly not something they they teach you when you're in college right that you're uh um, uh, you know that your code will uh, that you know your computer science degree is going to revolve around a lot of writing um, you know or as you and what I also found when I got like into management and stuff too is like oh I also have to be able to read contract law <laughs> you know and you know and yeah. uh, it, it's kind of funny how all these other <laughs> skills are also required yeah what I always say to like <laughs> junior devs is like you, you can communicate through your code and that that's valuable in and of itself but your code is not enough like it's just one tool that you have in mm -hmm. order to be successful because a feature isn't just code and and it's one of the things that you have to that you teach junior developers it's like it's much more than that it's it's you have to you have to explain yourself you have to explain where you're going the purpose of this you know where what, what it is that um, you know that your design is everything like that it's so much more than just the code and you see that sometimes in open source products and, and this yep. is like one of those gaps that always <coughs> like that always drives you nuts like you see someone show up and they just drop code off and, yep. and then disappear yeah. it's like, no it's not gonna work like <laughs> right. what what is that like how is how as someone who's reviewing this and who works in the community how do I feel about this I, well, I don't feel really great about this because, you know, well, what, I mean, what, is, what does this mean? Like, are you, like, is this perspective, like, is this right? Like, I don't fully understand where you're coming from on yep. this. Your code means something to me, but I, I can't read everything that all of your desires from just your code. You need to talk to me about it. And I also need to understand how you want to maintain this because it's, right, there's, right. there's that too. So it's, it's more, and it's almost like a relationship you have to build. And, and that's, that's part of it. Yeah, one of the things, um, you know, so I try to convince the students of, right, is that I'm like, you know, one of the most valuable things you can probably do while you're in college, you know, you have, in the grand scheme of things, you have a relatively large amount of free time, right? Um, and so contributing to some, you know, important open source projects in literally any way, um, will do wonders for your, not only kind of your resume, just to kind of, uh, show up for, um, you know, in, in context, but like, but like your ability to communicate, but also like really the big thing is for me, if I'm hiring somebody, seeing that they contributed to an open source project and had, um, their code actually accepted means that they not only can write the code, right, but they can communicate about it. They can, you know, they can, uh, I jokingly refer to it as like, they can play well with others, provably, yeah. you know, uh, and it's such a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and students listen up. That's, yeah, right, uh, right, exactly. You can, you can contribute to an open source project out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's absolutely. I, I agree. It's there. There is a there's a skill to it, and it's yeah. and it's something that 
really anyone who understands or is interested in, in coding can do it so, and, and can learn. It's, it just takes a little bit of practice, and right. a little right. bit of trying it out, and, and you can get a, you get a feel for it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the things I, I learned, but this was even back in consulting, is like, you know, make sure you have somebody else read your stuff. Uh, you know, often, you know, when it's those important emails or whatever, if you can convince somebody else to read it first and make sure they understood what you wrote, you know, in the way that you intended them to, uh, that can be a big help. Yeah, that's a good. I do the. I read it out loud. I read it oh, out loud yeah. myself. Yep. <laughs> that's yep. the other one I, I right. found to be helpful because we hear it. And you're like, it's oh my difference. god, this is when yeah. it's not in your head. <laughs> right, it's through right, your ears. Right. There's something different yeah. about this, that. I sound insane. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> totally agree with that um yeah i'll i do that as well um but uh yeah so that's I, I, totally with you um so um we're sorry um it got a little uh, a little dicier there with people trying to cross the street um so uh what other uh, you know how much involved are you in other parts of kubernetes is it primarily kubert or are you working with other components that you yourself are are looking at sure so uh mostly uh, my time has been um split into kubert and and then i try to like get involved in, in other areas but it's 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 been hard for me to i'm hoping like since i, I do a lot of work um in kubert as part of the scalability group mm -hmm. uh, that we can eventually like work with the kubernetes scale Scalability group. I we might Kubernetes no. might be one of the only projects that has an entire sig dedicated <laughs> right, to scale. Right, yeah. so, and I know Kubernetes does, so it's like I'm kind of thinking like maybe we should you know we can meet up and talk more about it. So I I, I was actually at the conference able to meet with um, the the one the ma one of the maintainers of that group. So and, and we're gonna try and meet up in the future. So I'm hoping that like that's another way we can get involved because right. I actually think we can learn a lot from each other where Qvert is very focused at scale, it's focused on like our, our goal is focused on the control plane and scaling the control plane. Like being yep. like a good member of, of the Kubernetes cluster. It's important. It's, it's really it's an add-on. So you need to be a good member right. of the cluster. Well it's a different perspective with Kubernetes, you're talking about pods and nodes and how many you can get and how many and how they perform and so on. But in reality, like the scalability of Kubernetes or of Kubert heavily depends on Kubernetes because right. all the stuff like <clears throat> once you get to a point where like provisioning storage and network and all that stuff, we have no visibility. Like we're we're just we're looking at just Cuber, but we want to know. Like, I have people ask me, like, okay, how long does it take for me to provision a VM if I'm using Ceph? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But like, like we could maybe find that out. Like, if we maybe if we you know took um, our perspective in the way we measure currently in in, in Cuber and maybe come with some new ideas, maybe there's a way we can kind of you know find a way to do this, and so then we can so I can eventually answer that question, right? And, right. and help them too. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's cool. I mean, and you're also, I mean, you're bringing a you know a, a real use case to scale. Right, um, and so I think that's also kind of benefit. You know, you can kind of hear other perspectives. It's kind of like everything else with the, you know, everyone has slightly different goals, and so the more you kind of talk about it, uh, the more you start to see where the similarities are and where the differences are, um, especially ones where, like, at least for me, a lot of times is um, the most interesting bits are like where I thought something was obvious, um, and I was either wrong, like it's just it wasn't true at all, or nobody else thinks it's obvious because for whatever reason the thing I'm working on makes it very obvious but what most people do it's not right um, and so I that's one of the things I find really interesting when you're having kind of those kinds of conversations with other people who are kind of using the same tool chain yeah I know that I, I know the feeling like sometimes um, you, you just different perspectives and you know sometimes you have different contexts so right really aligning on things yeah all the time you, you go through that and uh, conversations about features or bugs and stuff. right right so uh one of the things you know the, the show is called kb insider um you know uh what do you you know see in qvert or wider kubernetes you know in six months or a year that you're kind of most excited about what's the you know what do you think is going to happen next that'll be really cool sure uh i would so there's like two specific things that are like i'm really interested in uh one is um is this uh, the dra feature it's called uh, dynamic resource allocation there's mm -hmm. a guy from nvidia um who's been who's been working on this and, and pushing in the community it's really exciting for us because when we do provisioning now with the device plugin the design of the device plugin and what it's really meant to do is it's meant to serve i'm going to give i'm going to provide a gpu for for a vm or a container but i'm just going to provide it as pass through i'm not going to be able to also switch dynamically between pass through and, and vGPU based mm -hmm. on the workload that's coming in, mm -hmm. and this is actually how we want to run our data centers. Is we actually want to because we think about capacity, right?
right? We we have a physical device, and depending on who wants access to it, we we could be provisioning it as pass through, or we could be providing it as a VGPU. Yeah. And so it really depends on what we get. So we really need to switch through both uh, through, through each type, but mm -hmm. we we really can't do that with the limitation. So with DRA, this feature, we will be able to actually do this properly, which is really exciting for us because it's going to help us solve a huge number of bugs and race conditions we currently have to uh, work around this. Yeah. And also like it's going to improve our capacity. So right. that's something that's well, really, and, really exciting. Well, and you'll have a community maintained piece of software yeah. that's doing it rather than exactly. you know the, the one that you that home grew yeah, right exactly uh, so that's one of them the second one is, is um some of the hpc work um i, I see i'm um, hearing about like i think one of the things like for us that we really care about is, is being able to do hpc workloads high performance computing and and things like cpu pinning and, and but doing it in a very specialized way like it, what, a lot of the solutions that exist today that are maintained by the computer community are very they're, they're sort of um, very general like like for example mm. I, I only want to provision one whole CPU to this application or two CPUs of this well there's like so there's a whole world of like of like different configurations that you can think of and, and that's where like where we feel like there's a lot more work that can be done and so I'm hoping like that there's going to be some work and I'm at least from, from what I can what I'm hearing is that there's some work to, um, for some either some plugins or extensions to be able to like actually get down and, and make the make get more control at the um, for to, to enable high performance computing loads like maybe like you get L3 cache band memory bandwidth control things mm. like that like specific access like let's look at the CPU and let's 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 break it down into chunks and but let's do it using the Kubernetes API it's not Right, would, right, reinvent it. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. that's what we're looking, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing. Yeah, um, interestingly, I was talking to uh, a guy from Huawei, uh, Kevin Wang, uh, who's involved in the Kubernetes community, but he's also working on a project called Volcano. Have you heard of this? I haven't. Um, so you should check it out. But it's okay. uh, it's basically, um, it's kind of bringing, uh, you know, trying to help solve like scheduling problems for like AI scenarios um, oh, okay. and having different kind of schedulers. But it's kind of related to what you're talking about of kind of saying, um, hey, I want to prioritize how things happen differently when I'm doing this kind of workload. Um, and, uh, you know, so I don't know, I think there's a potentially some interesting stuff there for you. Okay. Um, I hadn't heard of the project either. I was like, oh, that's really kind of neat. Um, but then again, I have this weird uh, interest in schedulers that I don't know why, but I've always been really interested in them and never really gotten, uh, like, sat down and, like, worked on them. I just think they're neat. Um, you so, must be an old school Linux guy. Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. I've been I've been a Linux guy for a long time now. Yeah. Uh, I still remember installing, like, literally having a stack of floppies like this. Uh, I don't know if the camera can see me, but, like, you know, 25 floppies, you know, to install, um, oh, I just blinked. Uh, what's the, you know what I'm talking about, the, uh. The old versions of RHEL. Or... Well, yeah, no, before that, or, it, like, um, the, the off-the-shelf one. Uh, ah, uh, VBATS was one of the maintainers for a long time. Um, God, I can't believe I'm blinking on it. It starts with an S. Um, but it used to be a super popular distro, um, but it's not so much anymore. Um, but, uh, yeah, and it used to come on CDs in the back of magazines. And, and uh, But in those days, it was like you had to, like, pay attention to the... Um, uh, the settings for your monitor because you could literally light it in fire, um, you know, if you didn't set the resolution right. Um, yeah. Um, God, I can't believe I can't think of the name of it. You're um, the Linux X up and it can light your yeah, monitor on fire. Right, right. Yeah. Every year for the last yeah. 20. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually one of the big things that's what uh, kind of got me involved with Boston University to begin with when I was at Red Hat was uh, trying to look at, I wanted to know what like student developers are doing today right so that i could try to figure out how could we what could we add to the fedora desktop to like really enable developers you know it's like mac you know has been a lot of the developer desktop in recent history but it's at least for me right it's almost by accident right it's that they have a terminal so that's a huge win but then is it you know but but then it just has a, a good UI and it doesn't break, right? Um, but there, is there really is it really bringing that much to the table about developer enablement? And like, could we bring that to the table in Fedora? Um, which I always thought would be really cool, um, you know. And just like how, how much you know, we're, I was talking to somebody else too about this new concept of not new but newish platform engineering. Um, and so, what can we do in platform engineering in the you know in our our laptops to actually enable engineers? much better right because uh, i think there's so much opportunity there that we we're so busy trying to make sure that your email works um that we don't you know kind of go 
kind of sideways and like, what could we do for like developer tooling? You know? <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's cool. I, I still remember like uh, when the first time that I got access to Linux. I don't even know if it was uh, like I think it was Fedora or something. I'm not even sure anymore. Yeah. But I just me. Oh no, I know what it was. It was like it was um, it was a RHEL three machine yeah. in a lab. That's what it was. It was a RHEL three machine, and I was like, I just thought it was really cool because um, I just remember the terminal and I remember the, the UI and uh, and uh, working my way around there. And, that was fun. Those were, those were good memories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was uh, very proud of the fact I had a Spark 10 on my desk for a while. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so that was that was always pretty cool. Um, but yeah, uh, I was Linux and Unix, and but I was a Windows programmer for many years too. So you know, who knows? Um, so uh, what are you kind of most excited about uh, with KubeCon? Is this this you've been to other KubeCons? Yeah, yeah. I've been to. I think this is my third or my fourth. I'm not. Okay. I, don't, I don't even know. I lost count. But um, I, uh, I'm, I mean, I, I was always excited about uh, just talking to uh, some of the, the contributors. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, there's some people, I mean, every time I come here, I, there's some people like I, I know that I'm, you know, I'll see, but then there's always some other people that you just, um, you haven't and you kind of run into them and, and uh, meet them for the first time with their, when you see their names right. on one of the talks. And so that's always cool to see. And um, there was some, there's some, a few people that I was glad to have conversations with here. Yeah, yeah, nice. Um, yeah, that's cool. And uh, so how long are you staying for longer than the conference? Or are you just flying home on Saturday or it's Friday or something? I'm uh, flying home on uh, Friday. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, are you, did you get to see the tools? No, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I, someone has told me that I, I need to go, but I don't know if I'm going to make it though because I'm flying out tomorrow morning and you're oh. supposed to go in the morning because apparently it's packed. Yeah. But yeah. I saw some pictures, so I'm like, right, <laughs> yeah, I, it's me. supposed to be kind of a sight to behold, but I'm kind of in the same boat. Although I'm not <laughs> flying out till I'm flying out Saturday afternoon. So I was thinking about trying to see if I could do it tomorrow at some yeah. point. Um, but there's also like, it's like a scheduled event. Like I can't just, uh, you know, like roll up, you know, when I have a free minute, yeah. I have to go and like, it's a commitment. Um, and you know, when traveling, especially for a conference, making commitments to much of anything is very difficult. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I end up uh, like I'll I'll often have this long list of talks I want to go to, and then not get to a single one. You know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's cool. Um, and uh, you said you're in Connecticut. What do you think? Um, yeah. You know, you're going back there, and then uh, you'll go to the next KubeCon, or are you going to go to anything in between? Yeah, I. Probably the next KubeCon. I I really want to submit a talk. Um, mm. I'll probably do um, another. So I so this time was an end user panel. Uh, I'd, I at some point I'll submit a talk and talk about like a deep dive about like our infrastructure at um, at GeForce Now at some point. I, I'm sure people will be excited to see that. So I at some point will um, submit a talk for it. But I, I'm just trying to find the right the right time. I'm just gonna work with everything with my schedule and everything that's going <laughs> yeah. on. But yeah. Um, so we either in Chicago. Um, or the next one in you, wherever that is. And yeah, yeah. We can, we can look for that. Chicago is a good town, so you know. I've never been. But oh, I've heard. <laughs> yeah. My uh, my brother lives there, so I've okay. I've been a few times. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a good place to go. Cool. It's very it's funny how different it is than Boston because like um, all the streets are really wide, um, and you know the uh, you know most people like follow the driving rules, and <laughs> uh, you know nobody crosses the street without a light. Um, you know, it's just like all the you know because I mean I assume you spend a lot of time in and around oh, yeah. Boston. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Well, see, this is the thing. New York City, it's the same way. Like, yeah. there's no rules uh, yeah. when it comes to like crossing roads and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I think some of that got into the Boston culture. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, supposedly, and I, I believe this to be true, um, but uh, the term jaywalking was actually invented in Boston because there was an advertising campaign by the auto industry um, when, because traditionally, right, roads were actually for people, not for cars. And when the cars started to come out, um, they wanted to get people onto sidewalks and stuff. So uh, they did an ad campaign of, Look at those Jays walking in the street, and Jays being like fancy people, uh, and that's where jaywalking comes from, uh. supposedly. So, um, cool. well, so why don't we say, uh, you know, thanks so much for coming. Uh, it was really lovely to talk to you. I hope we can do this again sometime, uh, maybe in Chicago, maybe somewhere else. And um, you know, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. It's fun. And uh, hopefully, you enjoyed your little tour of Amsterdam. Um, you know, some parts of it we hadn't seen before. Yeah, the scenic so, parts. We almost made it to the tulips. Yeah, right, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't even know what direction they're in. <laughs> so, um, we should have thought about that as our uh, route, which is like, yeah. just drive out to the tulips and come back again. Yeah. Um, that would have been cool.